Okay, it's my pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Dr. Thomas Kai. Thomas is well known to many of us as a generous collaborator and friend to Cypriot archaeology, and it's always a delight to have him here for his research visits. Thomas was awarded his PhD, his DPhil, I should say, at the Institute of Archaeology at the University of Oxford in 2006, with a dissertation entitled From Villages to City Kingdoms, the Topographic and Political Development of Cypriot Towns during the Later Bronze and Early Iron Ages, circa 1900 to 750 BC, with special reference to the spatial and chronological relationship of tombs and settlement. And that's just the title. <laughs> Since 2006, he has been the A.G. Leventus Curator for Ancient Cyprus at the British Museum, and he now also holds the additional role of curator for the Aegean Bronze Age collections. He has been active in moving forward the Cyprus Digitization Project, providing online access for researchers for the objects for the early British Museum excavations and other collections, and also working on the 19th century documentation and notebooks. Thomas is currently working on the digitization of the material from Amethyst. He is honorary lecturer at the Institute of Archaeology at University College London, and actively promotes Cypriot archaeology in the UK to students, the general public, and the Cypriot diaspora, as well as curating exhibitions at the museum. Dr. Kiley has authored over 25 articles on subjects ranging from material culture to social complexity, and through time from the Bronze Age to the Hellenistic periods. His research interests also include delving into the characters, both foreigners and locals, who were part of the early story of Cypriot archaeology. He's also my co-editor, along with Dr. Anna Reeve, of the proceedings from a publication of our joint Kari British Museum conference held online during 2020 to 21. The volume is called Empire and Excavation, Critical Perspectives on Archaeology in British Period Cyprus, 1878 to 1960, and will be out later this year. I would now like to invite Dr. Kylie to present his lecture this evening entitled Law and Disorder, Managing the Archaeological Heritage of Cyprus in Early British Times, 1878-1914. Good evening. Can everybody hear me? Thank you. And also hello to everybody uh, tuning in online. I know some people are not very well and haven't been able to come tonight, so um, we all wish them our best as well. Um, the theme of my paper tonight, Law and Disorder, Managing the Archaeological Heritage of Cyprus in the Early British Colonial Era, sounds somewhat conventional because even though the early uh, history of British colonial Cyprus tends to be dominated by political discussions or perhaps isn't even talked about as much as later periods, I think it would be impossible to say that archaeology the history of archaeology is a neglected subject in this period, in the late Ottoman and early British period. Um, it's not always the case, however, that archaeologists um, are aware of the broader political issues. And similarly, people studying the political development of the island in this period aren't always fully aware of archaeology. And so what I want to do in my talk tonight is very briefly look at the relationships between um, specifically legal and administrative activities and archaeological practice. And I will explain why legal and administrative, particularly um, in a little while. Um, first of all, I just want to say, too, that the research for this paper has been done over about 10 years, but a lot of it coalesced in an article I wrote in a volume edited by Anna Lecca and Sir Sophia Antoniadu at a, from a conference at Athens in 2019, uh, published last year. And so I'm very grateful for the uh, invite to that conference and also for the opportunity to contribute an article to this. And the, the volume is available online for free from the University of Cyprus website. Uh, but the research has also gone on for many years in many archives, and I really would like to thank um, major institutions like the Stockbridge State Archives, the Department of Antiquities, the Stockbridge Museum, 
the National Archives of London, um, Kari, of course, the British Museum Central Archives, and many, many colleagues who helped me over the years. And this brings me to the introduction of my paper, which is the fact that in 1878, Britain became a protectorate of the British Empire. And um, that the museum, a kind of archaeological thief of, if not Britain, then at least of the British Museum and its, uh, its curator of um, Greek antiquities, Greek and Roman antiquities, and Charles Newton. And in a review of Ernest Kirchhoff's um, early volumes of the Olympia excavations in 1879, Newton pondered on the future for archaeology in the Eastern Mediterranean, and he noted very famously, and this is a, a quote I use at the beginning of one of my very first articles on the history of Cypriot archaeology, um, Newton said, there is a corner of the Levant where no such obstacles to excavation would stand in the way of an exploration undertaken by the British government. That corner is the island of Cyprus, an island which, though as only cursorily um, examined, has proved so rich in antiquities that the Museum of New York has already been created out of its spoils. Newton did not mention, of course, the fact that the collection of the Metropolitan Museum um, in New York had been offered to the British Museum by Chesnola. And, what, and he's also alluding only in a very general way to the broader political competition, which it was felt Britain was facing from other major nations such as uh, France and Germany, who were using, who were collecting antiquities and using them um, for political and ideological ends as well. Um, and this perception that Britain was falling behind was repeated in, in the major newspapers, and you also find it in the justification for the big archaeological projects that were mounted in early British times. And certainly, um, it was felt um, that Newton would have an absolutely unparalleled um, opportunity to exploit the antiquities of Cyprus for the benefit of Britain. Um, George Perrault, the French art historian, was almost um, jealous and envious when he reported on the fact that um, perhaps the only Englishman whose satisfaction must be unmixed, of course he's referring to the, um, the, the, the question about whether Cyprus was indeed of any use to, to Britain, but he said the only Englishman whose satisfaction must be unmixed is the capable and learned keeper of antiquities at the British Museum, Monsieur Newton. No more firmans to ask, um, waiting for long months since during the excavations at Nineveh or Halicarnassus in Turkey. No jealous law either, like the Greek law, forcing those who remove the earth from the monuments, not without great efforts and cost, only to give them up to the museum, the museums of Athens. And then, Perro is not, of course, under any illusion that a lot of this is related to state power. The army, the navy, the army, all the English authorities will lend their assistance to the work, will help to remove the objects discovered and send them without damage to the opulent museum where they will take their place where the, with the, within the sequences already formed. Now, again, uh, Perro would have been very aware of the successes of Newton before 1878. Here are two images showing two of the spectacular excavations Newton had organized or helped organize. On the left, we have an image showing Newton standing next to the famous Lion of Canidos, which he had excavated while British consul in, um, in, in the Ottoman Empire in the 1850s. And of course, the logistical um, requirements of these huge excavations involved the Royal Navy and also um, diplomatic permits that allowed uh, Newton to obtain permission to dig. Um, Newton became keeper in 1861, but he continued to excavate at a distance through people such as John Turtle Wood, and of course we should also not forget Henrietta Wood, um, her husband, uh, his, um, his wife, who uh, uh, organized the excavations alongside um, John. And Newton was able to, as a result, obtain large amounts of sculpture and architectural material from sites without going into the field himself. 
And throughout this period, Newton is also acquiring large collections through the antiquity markets, um, including several uh, bought in France. And effectively, he was able to outbid um, Napoleon III and other leading um, collectors. And so Perrault would have been absolutely aware of the fact that Newton was a formidable rival and that it was assumed he would, of course, make use of this new political situation to benefit the museum. Perrault, of course, could not be unaware of the fact that the French had also done very well in Cyprus in the preceding decades. Here is an image of the famous monumental stone vase from uh, the sanctuary of Aphrodite at Amethyst, which was removed to the Louvre from a French warship in 1865. France is part of the great game, the great scramble for antiquities, just as much as Britain was. Um, but also, of course, Britain and France and other major Western powers did not always get their own way. And on the left is the famous Bess of Amethyst, which initially was acquired by Mr. Loiseau, the uh, vice uh, uh, British Vice Consul in Limassol in 1873 with the intention of securing it for the British Museum. However, the Governor General of the island, we're still in Ottoman times, of course, um, basically um, refused him permission. He claims the statue for the, uh, the benefit of the Imperial Ottoman Museum in Constantinople. And there was a lot of toing and froing in the diplomatic world, with the British expressing absolute horror at how the Governor General could behave in such a way. Um, but as Veronica Tappan Brown pointed out when she first brought these documents to light back in the 1990s, she said, however extraordinary the sentiments expressed by the Governor General were, um, um, how, so however extraordinary the sentiments were expressed were conceived by the British, he was exactly as his title suggests, the Governor General. And so the statue went off to Constantinople. Um, it's a sign that even though um, many of the Western European archaeologists imagined themselves as easily able to outwit the Ottoman authorities and the Ottoman communities, in reality, they realized that they were facing um, an increasingly strong rival as well. And just while I have this slide up, I, I just want to draw your attention to the image on the right, which is a photograph of Bess in situ in, um, in Amethyst in 1873. This photograph was reported in various letters, but never found, but I managed to track it down in the National Archives in London. It's very cute. He looks like he's having a snooze. <laughs> and again, just to follow on that particular point, um, the, the Ottoman Empire is increasingly becoming a rival to Western powers because of the creation of the Imperial Ottoman Museum, the introduction of, of, um, of very focused archaeological laws in 1869 and 1874, but also a growing awareness of the value of antiquities to political and imperial self-definition, which of course is the role they occupied for the French and the British and Germans as well. So the Ottoman Empire may not be particularly strong at this period, but it's still able to legislate and control um, access to antiquities and who actually gets hold of them. But I'd like to stress too that we don't really understand this picture, particularly in Cyprus, to any great extent because of a lack of significant study of the Ottoman archives. A lot of the history of this period has been written um, from a Western European perspective, from sources in English and French and uh, German, and it's a very Westernized perspective, but I think um, we need considerably more um, research in the Ottoman archives as well. And of course, that's very difficult because of the, of the difficulties of the language and the script. But I think increasingly, um, particularly scholars um, in Turkey itself are actually looking at these Ottoman archives and, and trying to tell different stories. So, um, get to British Cyprus in 1878. I just very quickly want to give you a summary of what the shape of the paper is about, because um, the Brit the, the, that this short period between 1878 and 1905 actually witnessed an extraordinary series of changes, uh, reforms, reversals, and eventually in 1905, the passage of the, the first, what you might call indigenous Cypriot antiquity law. And there are five main phases. In 1878, uh, 
uh, Woolsey introduced a moratorium, banning all excavations on the island and allowing only a select number of bodies to conduct fieldwork, such as the British Museum and the South Kensington Museum, but also local colonial officials. And it was also in the context of this interdict that Alessandro Palmedicius Nola was prosecuted for flaunting the ban uh, introduced by Woolsey. Um, but it's not entirely clear whether this was because Woolsey had some idea to introduce measures that would be uh, favourable to archaeology, or was he simply making a point that the British represented law and order and that anybody infringing the ban, even on something like excavating archaeological remains, um, was not above the law. So, and of course, um, Woolsey and the British government at the time did not actively support any archaeological activity of an official kind on the island. Um, and then phase two is disorder, because um, in 1872, the Ottoman law was reintroduced, allowing the division of fines between um, the government, the landowners and the excavators. But as it was practiced on the island, it led to a free for all with a lot of private excavations, essentially for commercial, um, uh, commercial gain. And this also included an awful lot of abuse of the law, including by colonial officials. Then in 1886, Henry Bulwer arrives on the island as the new High Commissioner, and he investigates a whole range of archaeological and museological practice. And he introduces a ban on private excavations, and hither, um, 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 thereafter restricting excavation permits to scientific bodies. But he made with the proviso that there would be no distinction of nationality. However, all of these large-scale excavations that Bulwer's uh, edict permitted um, resulted in a lot of export of antiquities legally, which produces a reaction among the local population in Cyprus who were increasingly concerned with the preservation of their archaeological heritage. And also there is a concern that the museum is not being properly funded or properly managed. And then finally, there's another reform program starting in 1895-96 uh, due to Walter Sendel, but that took about 10 years to actually uh, finally hit the statute books. So as I said, it's a very complicated, torturous process. So law, why do we talk about the law? Uh, well, as Gilbert and Sullivan's song goes, the law is a true embodiment of everything that's excellent. Um, well, the, uh, the key point here is that uh, we talk about archaeology in terms of political, imperial, um, intellectual terms, but we don't really talk about the practical, legal, or administrative aspects of how um, archaeology was practiced, except at a very high level. And as um, George uh, Wright pointed out, it is manifestly unsatisfactory to discuss social matters um, entirely without reference to the law governing them. And so he's making the point that when um, modern commentators discuss archaeology, um, and the, the, the kind of the social and the political aspects of archaeology, they, they, they were not really discussing the legal aspects and the actual mechanisms by which um, archaeologists did what they did, but also how administrators and uh, the colonial authorities responded. And um, what's interesting is that in these in these um, early years of the uh, of the British protectorate, um, there was a very uncertain situation. The Ottoman law um, was inherited along with a whole range of other um, political, social, economic. Um, legacies, but of course the British only changed the laws that were absolutely necessary for what they saw as good governance. Um, reforming the archaeology laws were probably not a huge priority, but there were attempts to uh, reform the law. In 1881, um, Elliot Bobble, the uh, Queen's advocate, was asked to look into the law and to see um, how it might be improved. And of course by 1881 there had been um, a whole range of um, requests to excavate from local Cypriots, and, and then of course we get the excavations of Maxim and Bosch-Richter. So, but it's very, very unclear what the actual um, legal response of the British government should be to um, archaeological activities. 
And um, Bobble was asked to ask a number of questions about uh, about um, about uh, so yeah, so uh, but, but, yeah, so the British did actually introduce an ordinance in eighteen seventy eight, um, repealing all previous uh, laws. Um, insisting that all excavation must be done with reference to the High Commissioner. Um, the law also declared that it was illegal to deface a historic monument, and if, if people were to be allowed to remove stone from those monuments, they had to pay a fee. The, the infringement penalty was very high, £50, um, or indeed imprisonment. And also, it was declared that henceforth all objects of antiquity, art and curiosity, which I think probably means natural history, belongs to the government. All sales or gift of the same are null and void, misspelled, and items are liable for confiscation. So it's a very, very strict law. Now, unfortunately, the file in the State Archives is not complete, so I don't actually know what happened. What are, if the minutes related to the, um, to the uh, file have not survived. So it would be fascinating to know what exactly was being said in in 1878, but that ordinance was never actually um, introduced. Um, and in the meantime, of course, as I said, there were a whole series of um, applications from various people to excavate. Um, a lot of Cypriots asking if they could excavate on their own land. Um, Alexander Herides, for example, petitioned to excavate in Kithrea in 1879 presumably declined because there's no record whatsoever that he did those excavations. And Mrs. Florence Knorr, who is described as an ardent amateur of antiquities, um, she asked to dig as all antiquities have been sold or exported. <laughs> and she was refused permission on the grounds that other requests had been rejected, including from numerous local residents. Um, they included Ephraim Economides, um, citing previous experience working for the Ottoman government, and Nicholas Irides, who offered to dig on behalf of the new museum, though with the implication that um, he would get a share of the fines. But one of the most extraordinary documents I found in the state archives um, is the, the one on the right. In 1880, there was a petition from 42 inhabitants of Larnaca, Greek and Turkish speaking, asking for permission to search for antiquities. Quote, as for want of work, they are being reduced to great poverty. And the petitioners claimed that in Ottoman times, the excava excavation of antiquities was allowed to provide maintenance for the poor. Now, that petition again was turned down, but I would be very interested to know more about this because um, it's not clear whether they are saying this in order to try and persuade the British authorities to give permission, or perhaps this was a reality in Ottoman times. Um, most of what we know about digging in Ottoman times comes from the foreign consuls, the collectors, the amateur archaeologists. We don't really, as I said, know very much about um, the responses of the local uh, Greek and Turkish and other communities on the island, and we, we don't really know very much about the legal position either. So it is possible that digging, archae digging archaeological remains was regarded as a legitimate practice when times were difficult, um, as clearly they would have been for many of the, the villagers at this time. But this is just a fascinating example of what we don't actually know. And I love the fact that the document, of course, is written in Ottoman Turkish and in Greek, and somebody has actually signed the names of the 42 participants. So it's a fascinating example. Um, and then on the other hand, we have the privileged excavators. Um, I mentioned uh, Maxon Potrischer a moment ago. He excavates on behalf of Charles Newton between 1880 and 1883. So he's clearly given the right to excavate when many other people are not. And then we have the excavations uh, by um, Captain Kitchener on behalf of the South Kensington Museum. And it's very interesting, too, that in the Cypress State Archives, there are not that many documents referring to the permits or the, the, the massive bureaucracy that we see later on. And it's possible that um, a lot of this excavation is therefore being done basically as a... Uh, um, within the, on the understanding that they were able to operate um, within the moratorium. And Kitchener, of course, um, was, was conducting the, Cyprus, the survey of Cyprus at this time. Um, 
And what's interesting here is that the excavations for the South Kensington Museum were conducted not unlike some of the excavations in late Ottoman times. He was explicitly instructed to, um, to collect from the aesthetic and decorative and not from the archaeological point of view. The South Kensington Museum, they didn't want tomb groups, they didn't want archaeological context, they wanted nice objects for a decorative arts museum. Um, Charles Newton was offered some of the finds and turned his nose up at them because when Newton was offering his advice to uh, reform the law, um, he basically introduces a lot of modern thinking that we would regard as quite sensible today. Sorry, let me just. Uh, um, and for example, he suggested that the government should create um, lists of concessions that um, are very strictly controlled. He noted that the Greek uh, government had, had, had rigidly enforced the, the permits for excavation that we've seen in Olympia. Um, but he also noted that uh, in Turkey, um, similar regulations existed, but they were, they were constantly evaded. Um, and in, in another letter he wrote, uh, probably at the same time, he describes the trading of antiquities like the trade in tobacco. Now, the link is not entirely un, uh, arbitrary, because, of course, a lot of the, the, the trafficking of antiquities was being done by people with ships with, um, who were trading backwards and forwards across the eastern Mediterranean. So it was actually very easy to smuggle antiquities around the eastern Mediterranean if you had the, uh, the naval capacity. And, of course, it's quite difficult to check if you have a box of antiquities in a, in a hold full of tobacco or cotton or carrots. That's another good way of getting antiquities off the island. So um, Newton was, was, was um, uh, consulted um, to, to provide advice about how archaeology should be uh, managed on the island, um, but nothing seems to have been done, possibly because his suggestions were seen as just too strict, too dirigiste. But what's also interesting is that he, he doesn't just talk about restrictions on permits and legal issues, he also talks about methodology. Um, and just on the top right is a continuation of his advice where he says um, there should be a penalty in case the register of the discovery of antiquities should not be duly kept. The penalty should be enforced by the commissioner of the district. Um, whenever the foundations of ancient buildings are discovered, there sh um, these should not be covered, till, um, or covered over till the pleasure of the government is known. He says that plans should be made. And this actually is similar to advice he had given to Robert Hamilton Lang in 1869, so in Ottoman times, advising him how to record the remains of the, the sanctuary of Apollo and Reshef at Idalion. This is a good example of Newton's excavation at a distance. But it's very interesting that he's basically saying that archaeological sites are not just about collecting artifacts, they're also about recovering ground plans. And when in one of the um, one of the advice he gave to Hamilton Lang, he actually says if you can possibly take a photograph of the remains as well. So Newton, as I said, is not just advising on legal matters, he's also suggesting that the government need to take responsibility for good quality reporting as well. Um, I'm not going to say huge amounts about the Sarpet Museum, which was founded in 1882, and um, there has been a lot of great research recently, particularly by Jesper Pylides and others. But the establishment of the Sarpet Museum in 1882 was a very valuable cross community um, initiative rooted in broader interests in education and science. And this is something we see right across, obviously, Britain, but also right across the British Empire, as um, uh, colonies, protectorates, and so on, are developing a strong interest in having museums. Um, unfortunately, the Cyprus Museum was not an official body. It's, an effect, it's effectively a private organization entrusted with the government share of antiquities. So the, 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 the legal framework is very ambiguous. Um, this documents in the state archives tell us that the colonial secretary was not actually informed officially in um, 1882. And this suggests that it was not regarded as a major change of policy or law. And um, he's only, to, he's only um, uh, referred to when the question of selling duplicates from the museum collection arises a few years later. The regulatory framework for the museum was not very well worked out either and only really started to manifest itself when, in 1883, it was decided to 
uh, uh, to basically re revive the Ottoman law and allow private excavators to take a share of the antiquities. Um, there was an initial flurry of interest and support, especially financial support, but that very soon dried up. Um, and then for the next few years down to Henry Bulger's time, um, there was a lot of disorder. Um, privateering, um, sites being excavated largely or entirely for commercial uh, purposes, and this is something that was widely seen as a great scandal, particularly in 1886, when I think it was 441 tombs was excavated at Marion by a syndicate and then auctioned in Paris the following year. Um, Solomon Reynac said that it's a situation that one would not expect if Cyprus were still under the control of the Ottomans, and this, this was a great sting to the British authorities. Um, and of course, Colonel Falkland Warren is the person whose activities really exemplifies this sort of manipulation of the law, of the administration, um, and so on, in order to make personal gain. And um, there, there's an entire paper to be given on Warren because the, um, he was in fact lying to the colonial authorities. He altered letters. And if it were not for the fact that Maxon Richter was so... Um, assiduous in, in complaining, um, he might have got away with his, um, his, uh, his uh, activities, but eventually the colonial authorities in London realised he was a bit dodgy. Um, he was not going to get promoted, and so he, this is why he left the colonial service in 1890 and moved to Canada. But there's a lot of very interesting files in the state archives and in the national archives as well. Um, so, I want to look kind of a core part of my paper, which is um, reforming the law under Henry Bulwer. Now, um, we know from the work of Dr. Diana Marchides that Henry Bulwer was appointed to Cyprus as a safe pair of hands to implement the government uh, austerity policies, to keep expenditure down, not to make any major changes. But Bulwer did actually make a major reform of the law. When he comes to the island in 1886, um, he was, would have been aware of the fact that there had been a scandal involving Colonel Warren, um, a law case. It caused a lot of, um, a lot of um, noise in the press. But he looks into the management of the museum, he looks into the, the management of the law, and he eventually passed the famous resolution of 1887, where he says that it is desirable to preserve as much as possible to the island the antiquities and ancient remains found in the island, which again, is quite a radical thing for this time, that it is not desirable as a general rule to grant permits to excavate to private citizens, that the government may, with advantage to the interests of historical knowledge and research, give permission to certain cases to public museums and antiquarian institutions to excavate in the island for antiquities. And as I said earlier on, Bulwer also insisted that no distinction should be made between um, uh, British and foreign excavators. Now, Bulwer did not get a good reception in London for this. Uh, and it, it's possible because the British Museum were lobbying in the background, uh, lobbying in the background. Um, and he actually faced a, a, an uphill struggle to get his um, reforms passed. Um, Edward Fairfield wrote to Robert Mead, a colonial official, said, I do not agree with Sir Henry Bulwer's views. In the first place, I believe that the great mass of Cyprus antiquities are of no antiquarian or scientific value ever. They are mostly endless repetitions of well-known types. They have a certain commercial value as um, ornaments and curiosities. And I think that the inhabitants, whether official or non-official, are entitled to the benefit of these on paying the government its royalty. And he goes on and basically um, uh, slaps down Henry Bulwer. But Bulwer actually fought back. And this is really interesting. Um, you imagine very polite, very formal Victorian language, but you can read between the lines and he was absolutely furious. Um, he goes back to London on vacation in December 1887, and he replies that my comments were not written by me without cause and without careful deliberation. He stresses that unpleasant questions had arisen in regard to granting private individual licenses, especially when this involved government officials. 
and the manner in which private individuals were carrying out excavations, and that actually includes Colonel Warren, who claimed that he was acting in a private capacity when he was dig digging, and it was objectionable. Now, this, of course, is very strong language in the codes of the time, but then he absolutely lets rip. He says, um, Wolsey's original ban of 1878 had been turned into something of a free-for-all, whose general character did nothing to commend the experiment. Um, excavations were of a pecuniary or commercial nature, and they had been on such a petty scale and so ill-regulated and so ill-directed as practically to preclude the possibility of any other purpose being served. Um, and then where it really gets interesting is that it is wrong to disturb the dead after hundreds and even thousands of years, merely to throw out to the winds and the rains, the dry bones and the dust of what were once human beings, for the rifling of tombs and of filching from them what trinkets and other objects of antiquities there, there may be to satisfy a sordid object. But this is really strong language for this period. Um, and then the end said, the mere act of digging in the ground by incompetent persons for antiquities, which will produce money or have a money value, is nothing better than an act of vandalism. So um, he got his copy way. And eventually um, the colonial office realized that, oh, so Henry is angry. But then by this point, they're realizing that Colonel Warren, who's also stirring up anti, uh, anti bulwark feeling, is also um, not to be trusted as well. Um, did you have you saying? That's 10 minutes. Ten, okay, okay, right. Um, I'm just, I'm going to, um, a little um, trip to Sri Lanka just to provide a, uh, a parallel. Um, many of these officials are traveling around the, uh, the British Empire and they are conducting, um, obviously they are going against colonial officials, but many of these officials like Paul were interested in education, in museums. Just want to give a nice example from Sri Lanka, from Ceylon. Um, William Gregory, the, uh, the Anglo-Irish uh, governor between 1872 and 1877, again fought against the colonial office in London in order to establish a museum in Colombo, um, building on initiatives that had been um, around for about 50 years. And he had to fight against the colonial office who wanted him instead to organize artifacts to be sent to the South Kensington in, in London. And what I find really fascinating is that a lot of these local governors are recognizing local needs um, and often having to fight against uh, the colonial authorities in London who had totally different ideas. And I think it is very interesting to see how the, the more enlightened officials did actually realize that um, they had to act in the interests of the local community. And Cyprus, of course, had only been a British territory for about 10 years. And I think if Bulwer had come back a bit later, or if Cyprus had been had become British a bit earlier, the Cyprus Museum might have been funded on a much better basis because um, after Eight, seven or eight years, the British um, government in Cyprus were not investing in culture and things like that. So um, my time is limited, so I'm just going to jump over some of my sections, but I want to um, stress here is that a lot of the problems facing archaeology at this period um, were recognized by colonial officials. They recognized the problems of, um, of looting, they recognized the problems of trafficking of antiquities, but of course the late 1880s and early 90s in particular were periods of great economic hardship in Cyprus, and a lot of the colonial officials actually recognized that the people were digging furiously uh, because of economic hardship and not because of any venality. Um, or be, because they were mercenary. And there are numerous examples, again, in the state archive files of uh, the district commissioners simply slapping the villagers on the hands, confiscating their tools, uh, confiscating the antiquities, but not actually finding them, which they couldn't pay, or not imprisoning them as well. So you do see a kind of a humanitarian approach that one wouldn't necessarily think about. But that really is a reminder of my last section, which I will furiously jumped through. Um, I'm sorry, yeah, I want to talk, and it's always unfair to see Stilianu Lambert is here, and I've been working with her over the past uh, uh, year or two now, about a character, Gregorius Antonio, whose life really encapsulates many of the questions we see emerging from the social practice of archaeology in this period. Um, he began in the 1860s as a young man, as a casual excavator, um, he is trained by Max Anatasiewicz to become a formal 
um, supervisor. And then he goes on to become the foreman of many of the major British med teams of the 1880s and 1890s. He also helps travelers such as David Hogarth and Francis Welsh to explore the island. Uh, but he also continues a private practice of um, irregular archaeological digging as well. So in the 1860s and 70s, he's probably working with people like Chesnola and the consuls, but he becomes absorbed into the formal archaeological world as well. And of course, he goes on to work uh, for Hogarth at Evans in Knossos, for Hogarth at Ephesus, and he, and he eventually trains the foreman of Leonard Woolley in the Middle East. So he's an extraordinarily interesting and dynamic character. And we should not underestimate the huge importance of the foreman, because at some of these early British excavations, for example, there were hundreds of people, men and women, uh, people from across the religious communities, all working together. And the foreman was a bit like a, a super personnel manager. And here he is standing in the middle of the excavations of Philae Papos. And again, when we look at the huge quantities of sand that had to be removed from Salamis in um, um, in 1890, again, with hundreds of workers, it's people like Gregorio Santonio in the top right of the photograph on the left, who was absolutely central in ensuring that the work went well. And I love this photograph because it, it just suggests a deep degree of, of equality between the three men. And David Hogarth was, was, a, was very personally um, affectionate towards um, uh, Gregorio Santonio as well. He, he regards him as this extraordinary individual who even possibly saved his life in the ruins of Salamis when he was attacked by a great snake. But what's also interesting is that um, Antonio has his own archaeological agency. And here is a, a letter written asking permission to excavate a tomb at Enkami village, which was in danger of being looted by the local um, Timbo Riki. And he was actually granted the permit, which is extraordinary because, as I said earlier, local people were not actually given permits. Um, another lovely example of local agency, and which is very important thinking about how archaeological uh, mechanisms evolved, this is a report by Captain Hussein Ahmed, who's probably a Zaptia, um, recording the finds in the tomb. So he's basically the government inspector. And the government inspector is also very important because they were the people who deposited the lists of fines with the government to allow the division of fines to be done systematically. And there are lots of examples of Stavronides, Theodorides, and so on, people who are actually acting as government inspector, and they are, they are basically developing archaeological skills in the process. But as I said, Antonio also had a, a private practice because at one point in 1897, he writes to the British Museum saying, um, can you get me a job? I'm very poor, I have many children. He only had two, but he said I had many children. But he actually, in 1898, he excavates a Bronze Age tomb near Moroni, quite close to where the British Museum had previously excavated. And there's an extraordinary letter from Percy Christian to Murray saying, Gregory and his men have found this tomb, but you, I need to buy it quickly because Jabra Pyrithes and his men are coming up from Larnaca and they might buy it as well. So we see this oscillation between traditional um, tomb digging by villagers and the more organized excavations by the foreign teams. And this is an extraordinary slide showing a collection of objects that Grigori um, found in a looted tomb at Clavia Tremitos, which he then sells to the British Museum. Um, but the following year, he directed the excavations at the same site. So the site had been looted. Uh, Grigori finds some of the fragments, and he keeps the fragments of, of faience and pottery as well as uh, the intact objects. And then that leads the British Museum to the site in order to excavate it, quote unquote, systematically. So we're seeing an extraordinary dynamic, complex relationship between uh, Antonio and the, the, his um, colleagues in the British Museum. Um, and as Yanis Galanakis points out, just to quote from the bottom of the slide, Antonio uh, exemplifies how a tomb hunter could potentially turn with the development of archaeology into one of the first skilled archaeological workers um, who, with their expertise, have since contributed immensely to, this, to the discovery of the past. And Yanis makes uh, a comparison with Ioannis Paleologos in, in the Greek context, who again 
became very knowledgeable about archaeology, about periodization, because of their irregular activity. And Antonio uh, learned to know what Bronze Age artifacts looked like, for example, because that was what the British Museum were interested in, primarily. And so people like Paleologos are also transforming archaeology by being a crucial link between the realities of the village, of village economy, which had gone on hundreds of years, excavating tombs in times of difficulty, um, but then serving the archaeologists as they are developing their own um, big sites as well. And finally, I just wanted to end with a quote from Zeynep Celi, who has written about archaeology in Ottoman contexts, and she notes that how the, uh, the history of archaeology is conspicuously silent on the, the role of workers. Now, that's something that's rapidly changing, but it's still true to say that we don't focus enough on the social realities of excavators. And also, she says that um, it might restore some overdue recognition of the multitude of faces and bodies routinely featured textually and visually in the background of archaeological accounts. And our challenge is to actually bring those figures into the foreground. And Antonio is a fascinating way of linking the law of the Ottoman world, the law of the British world. And indeed, um, when he died, probably in the 1940s, he was um, living under the new laws of the 1930s. So he's an extraordinary figure for thinking about all of these social practices. And finally, I would just say thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Thomas. That was really fascinating. Um, I think, can I stop recording or? I guess we've stopped recording. Um, I'm sure people must have questions. Would anyone like to ask Thomas a question? Or, and I'll check the chat for questions as well. Um, I, oh, we have a, Diana? Let's try and see if we can make it online here. I don't know if it works, but <laughs> I'd just like to make an observation. Uh, can you hear me? Um, yeah. I just, I'm quite deaf. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, uh, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. Um, regarding uh, Bulwar and his successor, Lord Sassendi, um, I'd just like to make the point that whereas Bulwar certainly cared a lot about antiquities and did his best in a kind of individual way to do something about them. Uh, so what is that when you succeeded him? Um, did it much more in connection with Cypriot, in the sense that by that by his time, and partly because of the way he operated, the legislature, the, the colonial legislature, was a much more substantial affair. And the 1895 legislation that you referred to um, got debated at length in the Cyprus legislature. And the Cypriots were determined to try to keep their antiquities in their island and improve the museum. And so Walter Sandler was entirely with them. And I don't know if you'd agree with me, but from my research, thanks to you in the British Museum archives, I would say that it was the British Museum uh, together with perhaps Fairfield, who never wanted to spend any money in Cyprus at all, um, who sat on that and yeah. prevented the legislation becoming law until much later. Thank you. And, and actually, I, I leapfrogged over an entire section on Central. <laughs> and and okay. that, there are some wonderful um, documents in the State Archive with the petitions from local societies in Limassol and Paphos asking the government to do something about this volume of, of antiquities leaving the island. And of course, it was these large excavations, the CEF, the British Museum, Max and Patricia for the Berlin Museums. And so, yes, I have to agree. And um, I thought it was a whole sex I ignored. But, um, but Senbo also wanted, of course, to put the museum on a financial footing because it was virtually broke in 1895. The, the subscriptions had fallen off. Um, and it's also interesting because he's, um, at one point, there's a discussion about selling off more of the duplicates of the Cyprus Museum. So, um, you can think about that museum, that museum that they should, should, were stable. They, they should be used to make money as well. But yes, uh, it, but it's fascinating that Sendel pushes and pushes and he allows this amendment to ban export of antiquities, which is then sat on in London. But I would suggest 
partly this was because he had not consulted. Um, the, the colonial office in London could be just very old fashioned and they liked to be consulted about these things. And that amendment had not been sent to London for approval. And even if they had decided that whoever was lobbying for uh, against the ban of exploitation, I suspect that they, they took umbrage at the fact that this colonial governor is taking things into his own hands. Like William Gregory, I mean, he had to fight uh, about the Museum of Colombo because they said it's not, the, it's not the role of the governor to be making these in, initiatives. So I think you know, sometimes you see people like Mead and Fairfield, I mean, they're quite, they're quite grumpy characters. <laughs> um, so I suspect that it's, there's, a, there's a personal element there as well. Yes, up to a point, I think it's a yeah. financial yeah. issue. They're all grumpy on that. Yeah. Murray, my Alexander Murray is very grumpy. <laughs> but, but I think, yeah, and, and of course we forget that there weren't many people. It, it was a, the colonial service was tiny, the, the colonial office was tiny. So it's a bunch of big individuals with a, a strong opinion of themselves. Um, we do have a, an online question, Constantine Lozano. You have your hand raised. Would you like to answer I... the question? Yes, hi, thank you so much. Uh, I'm so happy to see you too, finally, with you even on Zoom. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear oh, me? Sorry, bit of a... Yeah. One thing made this work. Can you hear me now? Sorry, we might need you to type it in, I think, because... Sure. Um, we don't seem to be able to make sound come out of this. Uh. You don't have the sound. Yeah, maybe if you wouldn't mind typing your question, please. 